Romans 8.5, New King James Version For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. Life in the Spirit is a journey, and while many great passages throughout Scripture discuss the role and person of the Holy Spirit, Romans 8 is perhaps one of the most insightful. Sometimes the Holy Spirit leads us directly. The Holy Spirit can choose to act in any way and according to any timetable that he wishes, we do not dictate to him how or when he will move. Since the Bible gives many examples of him acting more specifically, we should anticipate that he will sometimes choose to lead us directly if we are open and available to his guidance. But how can we live a life directed by the Holy Spirit and fuel a passion for the things of the Spirit? We find steps in Romans 8.5. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. The question, how does one overcome the pull of the flesh, sounds like an old riddle. How can someone extract all of the air out of a drinking glass? The most direct way to get all of the air out of a glass is by filling it with something else. You cannot extract thoughts that displease God from your mind. Like the solution to the riddle, you need to be filled up with thoughts. Indeed, with an entire mindset that is oriented toward the things of the Spirit. This is why Romans 12.2 tells us, And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect, the will of God. Step one is to fill your mind with God's thoughts. Fill your mind with things of the Spirit. The Bible is a spiritual book. And the words in this book are spiritual food that we can fill our minds and live by. Matthew 4.4 4, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You see, the Bible is a spiritual book. And without the Holy Spirit, you will never be able to understand the Bible. The Bible has nothing to do with your intellect. It's to do with your spirit, the inner man. This is why without the Holy Spirit, you can read the Bible and it won't have the same effect as someone with the Holy Spirit who reads the Bible. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now for you and me to renew our mind, we need to know the word of God. For you to become a complete man or woman of God, you need to know the word of God. There is no substitute, absolutely no substitute for the word of God. The Bible is our reference point. It's the anchor to our soul. The more and more you read the word of God and receive it, the process of renewal of your mind begins. When you read the word of God, you begin to realize God doesn't make mistakes. You begin to think like God, to love what God loves, to hate what God hates. In order to know how God wants you to live, you must know his word. And if you want to know what God thinks of you, we must study his word. The word of God has power to renew your mind, but it needs to get inside you. And once it gets inside of you, there is a transformation that takes place. Are you struggling with sin? The book has the answer for you. Are you broken hearted and lonely? In the Bible, you will find someone that loves you and cares for you. Someone who will give their life for you. In actuality, he already gave his life for you. That's who you will find in this Bible. That is the kind of love you can have. We don't deserve it, but it's just been given to us. The word of God has the power to renew your mind. If your thoughts about yourself are about how you're not good enough or how you're not smart enough or how you're not beautiful enough, I encourage you to discover what the word of God says about you and renew your mind. Genesis 1.27 records that God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created them. 
You and I are created in the image of God. You're not created by accident. You didn't randomly come into being. God created you. You're not a random misfit that just happened to be born. God specifically created you. Step two, put to death the deeds of the body by the spirit. In other words, say no to your desires. Romans 8.13 for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. The person who has been regenerated by the Spirit is not stuck in sin. By the Spirit, the pull of the flesh can be resisted. It is possible by the help of God's Spirit to say no to your desires. It's pretty much the same as saying no to sin, but unlike the anti-drug campaign among youth many years ago, just saying no by itself will never be successful. Just saying no will never allow you to overcome sin consistently. Then what must you do? You must say no by the Spirit. Step 3. You are now walking in the Spirit. Romans 8.14 for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. The Holy Spirit leads us broadly, always, and more specifically, sometimes. He always leads us through his written word, which was revealed to the prophets by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1, 20-21 Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. We are to prayerfully, carefully, and humbly apply deep biblical wisdom to the situations we face in our lives. The final step is praying in the Spirit. Romans 8, 26 through 28. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. We know that we are weak when we come to prayer. We often don't know what to pray for in any given situation. The concern is not about the manner of prayer, the how, but rather the content of our prayers. What do we actually pray about? We learn that the Spirit joins to help us when we are struggling to know how to pray by interceding for us with wordless groanings. It is not, as some propose, that we should just pray whatever we want since we don't have any idea how to pray, and that the Spirit fixes them up and prays on our behalf to the Father. Rather, the verb often translated as help has a preposition attached to the front of it, which suggests that it really means joins to help. The Spirit is searching our hearts and knows that we have a mindset that is focused on Him, even if we do not know exactly what we are supposed to pray. The result is that our prayers are prayed according to the will of God, because the Holy Spirit is moving us thus to pray, and is presenting the prayers that He is guiding us to pray to the Father.